you uh, um, you've been nominated for the uh, position of uh, Chief Tensi and Religious Affairs Ministry. Is there anything else you wish to tell us? Very briefly, what more do we need to know? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, on behalf of the good people of Hunter West, I wish to thank His Excellency the President for nominating for the first time in the history of the Fourth Republic somebody from the Hunter West constituency to this position. Mr. Chairman, I was born on 17th April 1967 at Lee. I started my education at Takwadiki Primary School, continued at African Timber and Plywood Preparatory School in Samraboy. Then from there, I proceeded to Upham Secondary School. And then to Insign Secondary School for my sixth form. I went Honorable, to the university. I said that those parts, we have them on the CV. If there's any other thing of interest, tell us. Mr. Chairman, I'm okay. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Agaga. Honorable colleague, congratulations. Um, going through your CV, and in fact, I can testify to the fact that you're a lawyer. So this question um, has to do directly with um, law practice at the level of the judicial committees of the regional houses of chiefs and even at the national level. Now, there is the problem of inordinate delays with respect to the adjudication of chief tenancy related disputes at that level. And one of the reasons for the delays is the unavailability of funds to pay for the certain allowances of panel members. There is this very interesting case of litigants having to come together to contribute to actually pay for the um, sitting allowances of panel members at one of our judicial committees at the regional house level. If you're given the nod as the Minister for Chieftaincy and Religious Affairs, what would you do to ensure that there are speedy trials at the judicial committees of the regional and national houses of chiefs. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, there are basically issues of logistics, the composition of the panel, and then the method of adjudication. Fortunately, His Excellency the President has set up or has expanded the Ministry of Communications to include digitization. I believe that with the support of my colleague, the, when I'm approved, the Minister for Communications, it should be possible to digitize the adjudication processes at the National House of Chiefs. The other one has to do with logistics. Chiefs have to travel from far and near to come and adjudicate on cases and then if they have to spend days to adjudicate, there must be sufficient funds to cater for their housekeeping expenses. So I am certain that when giving the note and uh, with the support of the National House of Chiefs and the Regional House of Chiefs, we should be able to collaborate with the Minister of Finance to increase the budgetary allocation to the ministry so that these cases that are pending at the various Regional Houses of Chiefs can be dealt with expeditiously. Thank you. Uh, Honorable Domini, there have been numerous chieftaincy disputes in several parts of the country, including the Greater Accra region. I am particular about the Greater Accra region because it happens to be our national capital. There has been a protracted chieftaincy dispute with respect to the position of Gamanche. 
but thankfully we now have a government chair whose name has been entered into the Gazette and who is a member of the Great Accra Regional House of Chiefs. He was duly inducted into that position some time ago, but it appears there are challenges with respect to his attempt to properly occupy the seat of Gamanje and to have the recognition of all. If you're given the nod, what would you do to resolve this protracted dispute once and for all? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I believe that there's the need, the ministry actually doesn't install chiefs. The selection, nomination, and the instrument or instrument of a chief is the sole preserve of the kingmakers or the family or the lineage from which a particular individual comes from. But the regional house of chief has a mandate to ensure that when disputes are sent there, they are dealt with expeditiously. When giving the nod, whatever cooperation that these regional houses of chiefs need to ensure that these disputes are disposed of expeditiously, I will give the support. The other thing has to do with the enforcement of the judgments that are given by the court. Sometimes the courts, whether the traditional council or even at the Supreme Court, might give rulings relating to who is the legitimate chief. So when these judgments are given, the expectation is that they will be, they will be respected and whatever cooperation that will be needed to ensure that the judgments of the courts are enforced, I'll give my commitment when I'm giving the note. My last question. Do, do you think the Chieftain's Institution is still relevant in a democratic dispensation such as ours? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Chieftaincy Institution is, is still relevant. It is one of the revered institutions in our country. And the constitution of our country recognizes this institution and, and has guaranteed its existence under our constitution. Uh, the rules that they play in our day-to-day -day life and in our governance system is very important. So they are still relevant in our country. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I yield the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, Honorable Yabono. Thank you, Honorable. Congratulations. Thank you. Um, chiefs in active politics. The Constitution frowns on that. And um, what is your take on um, some of the comments that chiefs do make when? politicians visit them and the ensuing controversies that arise out of some of the com comments that are, are made by some of our chiefs during the political campaigns. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Constitution is specific that chiefs should not participate in active partisan politics. They are not supposed to wear party colors and attend rallies and show their political affiliations. Unfortunately, sometimes a few of them uh, go overboard. But the dichotomy or the distinction is a very interesting one. Because, uh, for instance, if uh, the president visits a community and the chief in the course of the interaction says that we wish to thank you for the free senior high school that you have introduced, are we going to say that that chief is participating in active partisan politics? I believe that is not so. So uh, in as much as the chiefs are not supposed to take part in active partisan politics, they are also part of the governance system. So whatever they do, I'm sure they are very mindful of the injunction that is imposed on them. And uh, they will do the needful. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Uh, my interest is in local governance. Colonial era 
the chiefs were very, very instrumental in the governance of the people. When we decided to transcend to democracy, we decided to go with decentralization. Decentralization in certain federal states virtually hinges on traditional authorities. But in Ghana, their significance in local governance has waned so much that, I don't know, but there is even a ruling at the Supreme Court that will further take away some of the authorities that they have in ensuring that our local laws, cultures, and traditions are obeyed. You and I will grow up, we all know we grew up in rural areas where it was almost like you have to look for a place to hide when you are summoned before the, the chief. The chiefs have the authority to enact certain laws and within the community. Today, all those with so-called modernity, all those powers have been eroded. And as such, it's taken away some of these cohesive forces we have within our local governance system. What will you do as a minister for chieftaincy to make sure that we reintroduce the value system that places some authority and significance on our traditional authorities so that they can also be confident enough in exercising some authority to support us in central government? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will collaborate with the National House of Chiefs, the Regional House of Chiefs, and the various traditional councils to have an in-depth study into some of the causes of these happenings and then offer appropriate solutions. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, some people have argued that in order to arrest some of these things, uh, it would be good for some people who believe in our traditional value system to go to court, the Supreme Court, and ask for the review of that uh, unfortunate judgment. Do you agree to that opinion as a lawyer? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The time for even applying for a review in that particular case has even elapsed. Uh, the National House of Chiefs is in the process of proposing some amendments to Section 63D, which was shut down by the Supreme Court. I'm very certain that uh, when I'm giving the notes, there will be deeper collaboration with the National House of Chiefs to see, in conjunction with the Attorney General, how that particular provision can be recrafted to give meaning and effect to the internment of the earlier provision. Thank you. Chairman, another we are in a period of gender. One of the most significant appeals that have been made, which to me makes sense, is from our Queen Mothers, who believe that in constituting the National House of Chief, Queen Mothers are not given any place. What do you think can be done in these days and civilization of gender equality and the rest. Do you think that we could do something in order to make sure that our queen mothers are also duly represented at the National House of Chiefs? The queen mothers, some of them have already made certain proposals to that effect. This demands uh, broad-based consultations because there are some traditional areas we don't even have queen mothers anyway. So this would demand that there is effective and continuous stakeholder engagement so that as an institution, is this something that collectively they will buy into, then we can proceed from there. Thank you. This one is a bit controversial, but forgive me. Uh, given the absence of leadership on our side, just some clarification. Full up. Yes, go ahead. Yeah, um, the question relating to Queen Mothers. 
we are mindful of Article 271. Article 271. The House of Chiefs of each region shall elect as members of the National House of Chiefs five paramount chiefs from the region. Where in a region there are fewer than five paramount chiefs, the House of Chiefs of the region shall elect such number of divisional chiefs as shall make up the required representation of chiefs for the region. Is it not clear who the regional House of Chiefs can send to um, the National House of Chiefs? It is very clear that every regional House of Chiefs has to send five representatives to the National House of Chiefs. And where the number is less, divisional chiefs will step in for them. So how, how, how does the issue of uh, Queen Mothers come in here? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That was a suggestion. That was why I was saying that that would demand broader stakeholder consultations. I am not giving a, a, a definite answer that Queen Mothers will necessarily have to go to the National House of Chiefs. Thank you. Just consultation or constitutional amendment? The, it's a process. So if after the consultations there's the need to propose some amendments, I think that will be considered. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, um, one serious mitigating factor against our fight against uh, environmental degradation and pollution of our water system, especially through illegal mining and the rest, have been identified by some people as a collaboration between landowners who possibly are subjects of traditional authorities. And in some jurisdictions, there's no way somebody can even farm on a particular land without authority from the traditional authority. What role do you think traditional authorities can play to effectively help us resolve the issue of environmental degradation, pollution of our waters, and the rest through illegal mining, chainsaw operation, and all these things that affect our fauna and foliage? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My predecessor started something like that. That is a honorable Jamsi. There was very good collaboration between himself and the Ministry of Lands and Forestry, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, and then the, the Operation Gallam Stop. So uh, this is something that can be continued. At the National House of Chiefs, there's one committee that is specifically tasked uh, natural resources and environment with the collaboration of the members of the National House of Chiefs. I think the chiefs can be strengthened or empowered to, to do more than what they are doing now. The other way is that sometimes the way people are giving permits to carry on prospecting or some activities in some of these communities is done at the flip side of some of these chiefs. You only see the presence of some of these investors or some of these people who have been given permits to work once they, when they visit your traditional area. I believe that when there's closer collaboration between all the stakeholders, the chiefs will continue to play a very significant, significant role in protecting the environment. Thank you. Yes. Yes, I'm always there. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, you are minister designate for chieftaincy and religious affairs. In Ghana, 71% are Christians, 18% Muslims, 5% traditional religion, others one and 5% n not really aligned. In all these, and my source is the Ghana Statistical Service 2020 Population and uh, Housing Census, all these religions are poor LGBT. I take you to our laws, the criminal code, section 1041B, clearly is again 
on natural canal knowledge. Then, to the people you are going to represent, the chiefs. They are the custodians of our customs and our culture. And you know that there is no space in our culture for LGBT rights. When you are given the nod, what will you do to ensure that LGBT is not close to our doors? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. As a Christian, and by the nature of my upbringing, I am against LGBTQI. Fortunately, our chiefs and some of these religious bodies have also spoken against the LGBTQI. When I'm given the opportunity and this decision comes up in, in cabinet, I am not going to recommend that these practices are encouraged in this country because, uh, for instance, our laws on marriage have not been amended. Marriage, as defined in our laws, is a union between a man and a woman. So with the, with the kind of situation that is going on now and the enthusiasm that we are getting from our religious leaders and our chiefs, I am very certain that when I'm nominated and I do some other consultations with them, because this decision actually is a state decision. My views may matter, but at the end of the day, it is the collective will of the good people of Ghana that will prevail in finding a lasting solution to these activities. Thank you. Second, the President of the United States of America, Joe Biden, has made very strong statements about LGBTQ rights. As a policy advisor to the President on religious matters, are you going to advise the President to boldly come out and as a matter of urgency, put the hearts of Ghanaians at ease that LGBT rights will not be countenanced on our land and even in our territorial waters so that Ghanaians are at peace. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The President has already made a statement in respect of this practice. And the chiefs, as you rightly said, and some of our religious leaders have also made an input. Our listening president, I'm sure at the appropriate time, will make the necessary interventions. Thank you. Third, and so on LGBTQ. Will you advocate for stiffer punishment for those who even uh, try to indulge in LGBTQ? Because, yes, he is in charge of our religion, and he is going to take care of the chiefs, who are the custodians of our customs. Are you going to advocate that as Minister for Religious Affairs, right. where I have already indicated that 71% are Christians, 18% are Islam, 5% traditional, and I mean, you see, Ghanaians generally, we don't like LGBT rights. But LGBTQ is too close to Ghana for comfort. Are you going to advocate for stiffer punishment for those engaged in it? Because it's just a, a, a misdemeanor under 1041B. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The punishment regime will be determined by Parliament. And I believe that when such a bill is brought to Parliament and I have the opportunity to speak on it, I'll, I'll make an input. Thank you. Honorable Member, today, under our laws, the thing we call LGBT and so on, what is the offense in it apart from unnatural canal knowledge? What in the so-called LGBT activities you know, apart from unnatural canal knowledge, will be amenable to the criminal code of Ghana? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, beyond the Section 104 that deals with unnatural canal knowledge, the laws on marriage also state clearly that the marriage is a union between a man and a woman. So apart from even the criminal sanctions, there are also sanctions for engaging in that kind of conduct because that is not what our law prescribes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, now we are talking as lawyers. How is it possible for any other person, apart from a man and woman, to get married? 
to, to occasion an uh, offense anyway, which, uh, which, which marriage registrar would have the authority to uh, put a man and a man or a woman and a woman, admit them into a marriage. How is that possible under our law? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. That is not possible under our law. Our laws prohibit such unions. Yes, I know. Yeah, to be more specific, Chairman is asking you a number of questions. Now, Section 99 and the Section 104 of our Criminal Code are clear on unnatural carnal knowledge and the specificity that there is unnatural carnal knowledge if one can prove penetration, the list of it, is that okay? In the relationship between lesbians, lesbians, in the relationship between lesbians, there's no penetration, okay. So, how, how do I know? How, how do I know? How do I know? Okay. Okay. Wow. Well, maybe, maybe there are experts in the practice here in this in this chamber. But I, I, I just assume that I just assume that in the relationship between lesbians, it may be difficult to prove penetration and etc. So, do you think that our laws, in any way, in any way, capture the situation of lesbians? Uh, if you look at Section 99 and the Section 104 of our Criminal uh, Code, and you talk about marriage, broadly speaking, if people in a homosexual relationship where we can't prove penetration, but they are living together in a house, they haven't proclaimed each other as husband and wife, and if people who are lesbian uh, they are living together, they haven't proclaimed each other as husband and wife. Are you able to capture them under our existing relationship and prosecute? I think that's the question. Are you able to prosecute people like that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's the need to expand the existing law to make provision for some of these happenings. Because the law in its current state, I have heard arguments that, as you are saying, because lesbians, there's no penetration, and it's, it's a way of extending the definition of unnatural canal knowledge. So there's the need as a parliament for us to ensure that we expand the existing law so that all these practices that are gradually emerging will be taken care of under our laws. Thank you. Yeah, okay. Uh, no, so, so first, and I'll come to you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, congratulations once more. Um, my first question has to do with uh, payment of royalties to chiefs. I'm sure that all our chiefs and queen mothers should be very much interested in this. Somewhere in 2017, January, your administration made a promise to ensure prompt payment of royalties due chiefs, queen mothers, and traditional councils. Um, I was trying to do a search to see um, how this promise has been kept. So far, there is nothing showing that this promise has been kept. How often will royalties be paid to chiefs under your administration as a minister? Thank you. The administration or the payment of royalties is not under my ministry directly. It's under the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. When I'm given the nod, I will establish closer collaboration with the ministry so that these payments can be made as promptly as possible. Thank you. Thank you much. Um, the second one has to do with uh, one action by uh, your government in 2017 when the ministry facilitated organization uh, of a trip to Israel for Ghanaian Christians. Uh, if I were made to understand that it was an inaugural trip, do you intend to continue in this trend where annually you'll be having pilgrimage to Israel for Christians? 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. This is something that has been started by my predecessor. And until and unless there is some reason not to continue it, it should be continued. Thank you very much. Can you say that again? I didn't hear the last part of the answer. My response was that this is a, a program that has been started by my predecessor. Until and unless there's some other reason why it should not be continued. When I'm giving the note, I would continue with that project. Thank you. What would you do as a minister to uh, reduce government interference in the election of president of National House of Chiefs? I am not aware of government interference in the election of presidents of National House of Chiefs. Thank you. Yeah, but, well, but there is, there is that suggestion. You know, there is out there Ghanaians who are watching now are having the perception that governments interfere with elections. Honorable Member, how can he speak to a perception? Ask him his own views. Well, uh, Mr. Chair, what I want him to, to assure the committee and the general populace watching him that under his watch as a minister, he would ensure that that will not happen. And that is a commitment I wanted him to give the people of Ghana. I don't think he can give that commitment. He does not take part in the election. But, 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 so Mr. Chairman, but, Mr. Chairman the, my point is that he is the Honourable ask ministry. another question, please. Very well, Mr. Chair. Um, Honourable nominee, in the NPP manifesto of 2016, you also promised that you are going to create an enabling legislative and economic environment for philanthropy to blossom under your ministry. How do you intend carrying this uh, out? Please, the question again. Uh, there was a promise that the MPP will create the enabling legislative and economic environment for philanthropy. That is a culture of giving to blossom. And I'm asking, how do you intend doing this? Honorable, do you have any ideas how to make philanthropy blossom? Mr. Chairman, I, 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 this is something that will have to come from the individuals themselves. So once an offer is made to them and they have the willingness to assist, I'm sure they should be able to help. Thank you. As a final follow-up, um, there has been concerns about how long... I don't remember how many questions you want to... I, I thought I'm done. I'm looking here for the opportunity. Oh, uh, that, that's yes, an honorable Ahit. Chairman. Chairman. Thank you very much, sir. <coughs> honorable Chairman. Honorable Chairman, uh, succession to the various stools and schemes has become the major source of chieftaincy disputes in this country, sometimes results in exchange of guns, fights, to the extent that people get wounded and are hospitalized. What plan do you have to ensure that we streamline this succession plan to avoid chieftaincy disputes in, in Ghana? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Already, the National House of Chiefs has started a process of documentation of the various successions to the stools and skins. Uh, when I'm giving the nod, I intend collaborating with them on another level where, if it is possible to introduce DNA genealogy database, which will serve as a complement to what is already existing, because now you trace your ancestry through a family tree to somebody who has a legitimate right to occupy a stool or a skin. So with this kind of collaboration, the, there can be some certainty as to which persons or individuals are eligible to contest some of these tools as and when they become vacant. Thank you. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, there have been ongoing discussions about whether or not churches should pay tax to the state. What would be your position on this? Uh, yes, that churches should pay tax. What would be your position on this? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Churches, when they operate as churches, are not amenable to pay taxes. It is when they carry on business that they should be made to pay tax. And I think that is the position that I'll continue to advance. Thank you. Honorable Member, when you say when they operate as churches, what they do with the money that accrues to them, who follows that to show that, in fact, apart from paying church workers, the rest should be for charitable work. Who follows to ensure that the monies they get from collections, they, they, they use it for the charitable work they are supposed to use it for? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Ghana Revenue Authority has a responsibility to, just as they do when companies present their annual statements to say that these are deductible expenses, these are not. They should be able to follow up on some of these uh, income that are produced to some of these churches to determine appropriately whether those incomes are chargeable for uh, tax purposes or not. Thank you. Yes. Oh. Churches, uh, Muslim religious sects, and etc. So let's just not limited to churches, but all religious organizations. Do they, or are they supposed to operate under a legal framework? Because when you decide to operate and take money from people and etc., are you to incorporate as a company limited by guarantee? Or what kind of, because we talk about when they do business. So when they do business, they are supposed to register a company um, a limited liability company to be able to do business or incorporate as a cooperative or whatever legal framework. Now, when they are not to do business and they are to pursue a social purpose, are they to register as a company limited by guarantee or anybody can just wake up, go and set up a structure and then call people to come and ask them to make contributions and then nobody accounts for the money in addition, the salaries and emoluments of the leadership of the religious sects using the money contributions, are they supposed to pay taxes on that? Is there a, a mechanism, a framework for holding religious groups accountable? That's, that's fundamentally the question. The issue about regulating churches is a very dicey one because of the provisions in the Constitution that guarantees freedom of worship association, etc. When priests or members of religious bodies receive salaries, they are supposed to pay income on those salaries. The law is clear on that one. Churches are also allowed to register under our Companies Act as companies limited by guarantee. So that is the, the, the provision of the law. But to, to ask them to pay taxes based on the other work that they do, which is unrelated to their religious activities, that one, the law permits those payments to be made. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, I'm a Christian, and I believe in the power of God to heal. But sometimes you realize that somebody is sick, somebody is diabetic, and that the person has reduced in size. Instead of seeking for medical attention, you, the person ends up in prayer camp and continues to pray fast to worsen his or her. Uh, condition. Honorable Nominee, what will you do to ensure that 
Churches, uh, I mean, prayer camps are advised to encourage, encourage patients who come to them or uh, their members who come to them to seek for spiritual healing, referring them to seek medical attention when need be. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a question of faith. Uh, if the individual believes that when he's sick and he goes to a pastor or a priest and he prays for him or her, he can get his salvation, we cannot take away that belief in that faith from him or her. But going forward, when I'm giving the note, there should be enough education for some of these adherents or some of these church worshippers to know the difference between an ailment that needs medical attention and the other one that has to do with the salvation of your soul. Thank you. Okay. Yes, Giselle. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, there's often a case of noise pollution caused by some churches and residents and people in, who live in residential areas there are some conflicts in, let's say, the planning, the planning and location of some of these um, churches. What are you going to be able to do or help to alleviate the challenges that people have, even though they may be Christians, but some of the churches can be making a lot of noise, high, much higher, um, above the average decibel permitted level, let me put it that way, for residential areas. It's quite common in residential areas, but generally on the whole, what are you going to be able to do to be able to bring some sanity into that aspect? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The noise levels are relative. And if the uh, fiscal planning departments of most of these assemblies are on top or are doing their work very well, there are, in the course of the fiscal planning, areas are demarcated for churches, mosques, and other religious facilities. So that coordination or that collaboration should exist. The other one has to do with tolerance levels. We live in a community where we have to tolerate each other. So whilst people have a right to express their religious beliefs, we have to marry it with a kind of noise that is permissible within a certain environment. So that will need a lot of dialogue and give and take so that we can coexist in these communities. Thank you. So would you, Mr. Chairman, would you give the assurance that you, you would liaise with the local government authorities and so on? Because it is an issue. Some people may not be able to voice it out. But on this platform, we have the opportunity to voice it out for people who are disturbed by the noise. That doesn't mean that they are against the religion or the worship. It's just that sometimes it can be creating noise. Would you collaborate in that manner? Thank you. Honorable member, I give you the assurance that that collaboration will be there. Thank you. My second question has to do with development in districts and the traditional, in collaboration with traditional councils. Now, would you recommend or would you support a structure, a more official structure of development being supported by all these stakeholders? That is that kind of policy direction coming from the top, such that every traditional council, every traditional area, for example, has that developmental committee or even maybe going beyond a committee. I don't know what structure it is. Just that, to make sure that there's that formalization. Because sometimes when there are some disputes, if there was a committee in that manner with all the stakeholders involved, maybe there could be some resolution along the way that, look, all we want is development. Because very often, you and I know, we go to see the chiefs and they all say the same. All we want is development. How can we all push this developmental agenda in a much more structured and proper way? How could you support that as Minister of Chieftaincy coming into the picture? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Already the structure at the Metropolitan Municipal and District Assembly levels makes provision for the involvement of chiefs 
in the selection of the government appointees to the various assemblies. So there's this collaboration already in existence. When I'm giving the nod, we'll strengthen this collaboration so that the kind of development that we have or we are expecting in the various metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies are achieved. Thank you. One last follow-up question to this. Your so, last question, please. Yes, thank you, Chairman. So you are looking at it from collaboration with the district assemblies, but I'm looking at it from the other way around. The chiefs are strong. We are powerful. Can there also be that structure to support them also on their side? Otherwise, they will be skewed towards just coming to what the district assembly wants to do. There must be that connection and collaboration so that both is a win-win situation for both. So they don't have to, because representation will be just a few. It is not the whole traditional council who may be able to represent it on the district assembly. And there may, ever, there may never even be a time when the whole district assembly leadership will be meeting with the traditional council and discussing things together. I hope you see where I'm coming from. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The chiefs themselves are also agents of development in their various traditional areas. Sometimes there are situations where they themselves initiate certain projects and bring them to the various municipal, metropolitan, and district assemblies for assistance. And when these offers come, they are considered favorable. Thank you. Yeah, so good. Most good, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, my first question relates to a very sensitive matter which borders on religious charlatans. A few bad nuts who give religion a very bad name and endanger society. Uh, indeed, uh, Jesus the Christ himself warned in Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, and if I have the permission of the chairman to quote from my Bible, Jesus the Christ said, And many false prophets will arise and lead many astray. And because lawlessness will be increased, the love of many will grow cold. Matthew chapter 11, Matthew chapter 24, verse 11 and 12. You're seeing so many charlatans emerge in these days. And the position of our country for many, many years has been self-regulation. Let the churches, let the religious bodies self-regulate. But it appears that that hasn't worked. And a lot of religious leaders themselves have voiced out this frustration. And the number of false prophets are increasing. We, we all see it on the screens. They are kicking pregnant women in the name of performing miracles. They are giving concoctions, and there's a public health crisis. Doctors are warning. They deny them access to health care. We need to maintain a balance between, between Article 21 1C, freedom of religion and to manifest your religion, but also the state has a responsibility in Article 37 of the Constitution, Article 37, 2B, that the state shall enact appropriate laws to assure the protection and promotion of all other basic human rights and freedoms, including the rights of the disabled, the aged, children, and other vulnerable groups in development processes. Reading from your handover notes, I realize at page 16 that in the offing, you've, the, the, your predecessor began some discussions about a national policy on religion to help address some of these uh, threats and dangers to the health of our society. What is your view about all of these charlatans who have taken over our airwaves, uh, polluting, brainwashing people? And we've seen that it can be very dangerous. But, uh, Pastor Wright, he, 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 they just bend down a whole congregation 
killed people. It can, it can be really terrible. And we are getting there. What's your view on this matter? And how do you intend, through policy, to maintain this fine balance, freedom to, to manifest religion, but also in a responsible way that does not endanger uh, vulnerable uh, citizens? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There's the, there's the need to have a balancing act between people professing religion and then some other people trampling upon the rights of these individuals who visit these churches. That is why my predecessor has started this policy on religion. As a ministry, when I'm giving the nod, we cannot control or seek to register or regulate the churches. But what we can do is to create an enabling environment that would make the individuals who belong to these faiths practice their faith, not at the expense of any violations of their human rights. So when I'm giving the nod, we'll follow up on the draft policy and hold some broader consultations with the religious bodies as a way of self-regulating themselves. Already, there are a few structures in place. So we must not allow a few bad notes in any profession to dent the hard-won reputation of those who are really doing well. Because in as much as they are charlatans, they are very good priests and very good pastors and very good religious institutions. So we have to act in such a way that we will not throw away the baby with the bathwater. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my second question relates to the president's uh, pet project. He seems to be very fascinated about uh, giving this country a national cathedral. Is that project still a priority uh, in the midst of a pandemic and all the challenges that we are facing? Uh, what is the briefing you have received on the National Cathedral project. Is, is it alive and is it still a priority of priorities for the president, as he, he stated some time back, especially in the midst of this pandemic when we are looking for money for vaccines? The National Cathedral project is still a government priority project. The, His Excellency, the president, has indicated that that project is going to be constructed at very least cost to the state. I know that the Red Church, for instance, has designated July and December of each year as days that they would do a special offertory to gather funds for the uh, purpose of the contributing to the construction of the National Cathedral. The, there was an action in the Supreme Court challenging the constitutionality of the establishment of the National Cathedral. And the Supreme Court uh, ruled against the petitioner who went to court. So it's on course, and already the contractors are on site, and work is ongoing. Thank you. By way of follow-up, do you know how much it will cost this country? What is the cost of the National Cathedral? I haven't received any briefing as to the uh, entire cost of the project yet. What I do know is that some seed money has been advanced for the construction of the cathedral. Thank you. $25 million. So $25 million has been, has been extended uh, as seed capital. Uh, yes, that's to my knowledge. Thank you. Okay. <clears throat> my, my final question uh, will bring us to chieftaincy. Uh, do you have any latest reports from the briefing you have received on the number of flashpoints that uh, we have as a country and how you intend to resolve these matters expeditiously to bring uh, a resolution? Because as you know, it can degenerate into a national security uh, crisis. So how many flashpoints do we have currently? And what are the uh, expedited policies you have in, 
in mind uh, at the moment, if approved, uh, to address this matter. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My predecessor inherited 325 chieftaincy disputes and was able to resolve 270 of them. Currently, there are 300 chieftaincy disputes that are pending. The issue of adjudication of these disputes, the issue of logistics, I spoke about them even before you came in, and the digitization of the entire adjudication process. These are ways that, when I'm approved, we put in place to ensure that these disputes are disposed of as expeditiously as possible. Thank you. Finally, a uh, follow-up. Oh, finally. You have said your last. Uh, become yes, finally. but uh, a Nobody the need for a follow-up as right. a reason. But yes. I'll, I'll follow your cue, Chairman. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Honorable nominee, in 2016, the Minister of Chief Tenancy and Religious Affairs conducted a research and based upon that, developed a strategic implementation plan to execute a project called Harmful Traditional Practices Project. What is the status of that project? And would you consider a similar project that deals with Nemeka religious practices in Ghana? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The briefing that I received so far points to the fact that these projects are ongoing. The issue about female genital mutilation, the issue about widowhood rights, and some other harmful practices. There is the need to involve the National Commission on Civic Education in this particular enterprise so that we can have a, a very good approach to the resolution of some of these harmful practices. Thank you. What about the second aspect of it, looking at the inimical religious practices? I ask whether you consider a similar project to deal with that situation. Sorry, I didn't get the last bit of your question. The of the question was, would you consider a similar project that would deal with inimical religious practices? Um, our colleague, Honorable Okujeto, made reference to some of these things in his last question. And in my answer, I said that these are issues that we need to deal with. Thank you. Now, my second question is about chiefs as development agents. Our chiefs have been development agents since pre-colonial times. And still, we expect them to lead the development agenda of their communities. In fact, one of the charges usually preferred against chiefs for these two men is their inability to deliver development in their communities. Between, between tradition and modernity, what should be the specific role of these chiefs in delivering development in their communities? And how are they empowered to be able to do that? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The role of chiefs in development in their various traditional areas cannot be downplayed. Indeed, some of the hospitals and schools that we have in this country was as a result of some of our chiefs giving our lands and encouraging some other people to uh, invest in these areas, in their various traditional areas. The way and manner in which the uh, royalties are distributed. Some funds are given to the district assemblies and some chiefs for the maintaining the status of those traditional areas and the schools. So we cannot delink the chief's role as a development agent in his traditional area from his core functions as the chief of the community. So that blend should necessarily exist. Thank you. The Chieftaincy Act and its regulations 
are silent on the criteria for the elevation of divisional chiefs to the status of paramountcy. What do you think must be done to ensure uniformity in terms of criteria so that we can upgrade divisional chiefs with a known process other than anything that uh, comes into mind? What do you think must be done? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The elevation of chiefs or divisional chiefs to paramounties is based on a number of factors. Uh, the institution of chieftaincy, fortunately, are masters of their own rules. When I'm giving the nod, with the kind of collaboration that will be taking place between the ministry and the national house of chiefs and the regional house of chiefs, you can develop a blueprint to, to ensure that uh, there are standards for doing some of these things. But we have to take note of the fact that the various traditional areas have various rules governing who becomes what. So we have to have that kind of collaboration and understanding so that we cannot have one standard rule that would be applicable to all the traditional areas that we have in this country. Thank you. Thank you. Colleagues, I insisted that today being Friday, we want to close early. So I'll insist on the six on each side. But, so can you let me come to leadership? Now you're the available leader, right? So Honorable, I'll, I'll count you out today. Yes, because I've done six already. Uh, available leader. Sorry? Uh, is that you, you are foregoing the available leader one? So if you are foregoing that, I'll give it to him. <laughs> there is one question, please. Mr. Chairman, I can only but be grateful for the opportunity, even though I wish you could at least make it two for me, because it is taking me by surprise, and I have to drop some of the questions that I prepared to ask. So please, Mr. Chairman, with Honorable your permission. Go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, Honorable nominee, my first question has to do with your relationship with maybe one will say chiefs or the traditional authority. Um, in the area that you have operated as member of parliament before. I'm sure you do recall that um, chiefs of the Hunter West had cause to uh, invoke curses on you. Um, the upper, is it Discov or Discovery, you know, traditional area, called on their ancestors and their gods to deal with you for insulting the paramount chief of the area, of Brimpong Imadochi, the 14th. Um, based on this, how do you assure this committee and this nation that you have what it takes to deal with chiefs across the country as the minister responsible for that sector. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I am a prince. My father was a chief. So I should be the last person who insults any chief. It is never correct that I insulted any chief. Some members of our party went overboard in some of the comments that they made. That issue has long been resolved. Indeed, when my nomination came, the upper disc of chief was one of the persons I went to officially inform him about my nomination by the president. He congratulated me and gave his blessings for my nomination. Thank you. Right. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'd like the nominee to also take a very good look at these pictures. Um,
I'll explain, you will not understand now. Um, these are pictures from the northern region, House of Chiefs. Northern region, House of Chiefs. Currently, they, as you can see, work from under a tree. That's the Northern Region House of Chief. They work from under a tree. And this is because the facility that they originally worked from was put under renovation in 2019. And work on that project has since stopped, making it very difficult for the work of the authority to go. So on behalf of the people of Dagon and all the chiefs in Northern region, I want to know if you have been briefed on the state of this renovation and how soon work on it will be concluded. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My briefing indicated that there, there are some work going on in some of the regional House of Chiefs. And uh, we are also very certain in our minds that they are preparing the 2021 budget. The bane of the ministry has been lack of funds, adequate funds uh, for capital uh, investments in the area. And I believe that uh, when the budget statement comes before this honorable house, Honorable colleagues would uh, put in a plea for the ministry so that the budgetary allocation is enhanced so that some of these projects that you are talking about can be uh, completed as soon as possible. Thank you. You can't assure the committee how soon this project will be uh, complete. Uh, Mr. Chairman, uh, I need to uh, know what provision has been made or is going to be made in the 2021 budget so that I can speak affirmatively on this particular project. But we have my assurance that... Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, but whatever are you it, suggesting there was no budgetary allocation before the contract was awarded? Is that the case? I, I haven't said so. I have stated that there are a number of ongoing projects. As and when funds are released, these projects are continued. But I'm giving you the assurance that when I'm giving the note, I will expect that action on this particular one, which you brought to my attention. Thank you. Say that, sir. Uh, no, Reverend, you said you wanted one. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, congratulations, Honorable Nominee. I must congratulate you um, for the sound position that you have indicated on pertinent issues of chieftaincy and religion, and I must indicate my satisfaction and confidence that with these inclinations that you have given, there's no doubt that you would leave legacies at this ministry. On this note, I congratulate you. Unless you should have, you could have done behind us. Wait, now I'm coming to leadership, but the leaders are here now, so. Uh, I didn't ask because, I didn't ask because it was assumed that I'll be leadership. Now, a leader has come, and then uh -huh. I still don't get the opportunity. You have taken leadership uh, oh. opportunity oh. a couple of times. Please. I'll give you one. One. OK. <clears throat> OK, I have one Hydra-headed question. <laughs> one Hydra-headed question. It has to do with the role of chiefs in development. Uh, and then also the witches camp. The witches camp. The witches camp that we have in Northeast region. And Article 272C of the Constitution. It deals with the role of the National House of Chiefs to identify harmful cultural practices traditions and etc and have them outlawed you've seen that yes so as uh, 
minister responsible for chieftaincy if you get the nod. How, what, what are you going to do and how are you going to guarantee us that by the end of your tenure, you will get the National House of Chiefs to clamp down on, on such an institution uh, and, and have it abolished and, and the practice stopped. And also uh, the role of chiefs in development, especially in the era of spatial planning, uh, land use, uh, management of development at the local level, chiefs really have greater capacity and influence in, in, in the communities. This whole thing about land guards and etc., there's definitely a correlation between their desire to control the lands under their, their, their jurisdiction vis-a-vis -vis, uh, state law enforcement mechanism for controlling land development. How are you going to make them more responsible in the management and development of land, where people just take lands, develop them, no access rules, no planning, nothing. People just build because the chief has given the lands uh, to them. So if you can combine these and generally provide some response, given the restrictions I'm under. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The collaboration that I have to establish with the National House of Chiefs to ensure that some of these harmful practices are dealt with the law is provision for that. So when giving the note, I'll pursue that part. The issue about the special planning and chiefs as agents of development in their various traditional areas have indicated that they are already doing it. The setback has been that sometimes the chiefs will be in their various traditional areas and people will come in there to say that I have a concession, I have a permit to come and do A, B, C. So if right from the onset, these chiefs are involved in the entire planning process. I think these issues will be resolved. So there's a need for a closer collaboration and involvement at the initial stages of some of these developmental projects. And I'll pursue that part when I'm giving them. Thank you. Yes, Honorable Leader. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I just want to find out from the nominee in answering the question about uh, the cost of the construction of the cathedral. He said what he knows is that 25 million US dollars has been extended as seed money, right? He said 25 million dollars has been extended as seed money. Yes, that is correct. But you don't know the total cost of the project. I don't have any information to that effect. Come again? I don't have any information to that effect yet. Uh, but when they were giving the briefing, you didn't ask. When they were telling me about the 25 million as the seed money, I thought that would have been an obvious question that should follow. What is the anticipated amount that will be used to complete it? The National Cathedral is actually not under my ministry. I only did a preemptive strike by anticipating that it was a likely question to come. That's why I did some reading on my own about it. But the National Cathedral is not under the Ministry of Defense and Religious Yeah, Defense. I know, because uh, you know, it has to do with uh, religious activities. So maybe that's why you, on your own, tried to find some information on it. But did you find out the cause of the demolition? The, the judges' homes, the passport office, those demolitions, have, have you asked about the estimated cost of the demolition. Mr. Chairman, I don't have any idea about that cost. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, he was just answering or making his comment about the Special Planning Act. And one of the major programs that you have, especially in the urban centers, when chiefs have sent their uh, schemes and it's been approved where they made provision for all the necessary amenities, roads, schools, recreational centers, and what have you. Once the place starts developing, then on their own, they start agitating for rezoning and, and completely messing the, the scheme, very scheme that they have done. I know that not even this house has been mandated by our constitution to, to amend acts that affect differences. But this action of our chiefs, how do you hope to get them to 
uh, comply with the Special Planning Act. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Once there is closer collaboration between the traditional leaders, the municipal, metropolitan, municipal, and district assemblies, and the Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources, there should be a way out of resolving some of these issues. Because once you give out the land, and then the developments catch up with it, there should be a way of ensuring that the purpose for which these lands were reserved are adhered to. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Chairman, there is this uh, erroneous impression that is uh, being banded around by our chiefs that, oh, we give this land for you to construct parliament. Now that you are not using it for parliament, reverse it to us. And, but there's a Supreme Court ruling that says that once that land is going to be used for the public good, it does not necessarily have to be referred to them. How do you hope to get them to appreciate this so that they may stop the unnecessary litigation that in many district assemblies is one of the major challenges they have with the traditional authorities? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. There is a need for some education and some further engagement with these traditional leaders so that they appreciate some of the concerns that you have raised. And when I'm giving the note, we will continue along that path. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, the Special uh, Planning Act, precisely Section 93, 3 and 4, it's talking about when rezoning had to be done. Because of the way the, uh, for lack of better word, the Nananum or the Paramount chiefs or the chiefs and the district assembly are abusing the rezoning and virtually messing up the scheme. When we were passing this act in 2016, Parliament said that if you needed to rezone land that is used or reserved for public use, you have to come to Parliament. This is not really popularized, and you still get a lot of assemblies and Nananum uh, chiefs go around rezoning without coming to Parliament. How do you hope to popularize this for them to appreciate that if it has to be done, then it must necessarily come to Parliament to comply with the Act? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The, the once there's a law in existence regulating how some of these things ought to be done, I think the laws ought to be followed. Thank you. I don't know whether you were given a briefing on the cost of pilgrimages, both the Muslim and the Christians. You know, recent, recent past, the, the Minister of Chieftaincy has been facilitating the pilgrims to uh, Jerusalem. And then the government to have been supporting in one way or the other the Muslim to be able to embark on the pilgrimage to Saudi Arabia. I don't know whether in the briefing you you asked about the, how much it's been costing us annually. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I haven't received any such briefing. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, my colleague. In your constituency, there, you pulled down a dilapidated youth centre and promised to construct a stadium to replace it. Is that correct? It's, uh, I In your own constituency, you pulled down a dilapidated youth centre with the hope of replacing it with a stadium, with a promise that you were going to construct a stadium in its place. Is that correct? That is not correct. I have not pulled down a dilapidated youth centre to construct a stadium in my constituency. Oh, so since you became a member of Parliament in 2017, you have not made an attempt to pull down any youth centre in your constituency? I'm saying that I have not pulled down any youth centre. What I'm doing in my constituency is rather constructing a youth centre in my constituency from the uh, funds that are available to MPs. When did you start the, that construction? When did that construction start? When did, this, when did you start the construction? The construction started sometime in 2018. 2018. Is it completed? Sir Chama, it's not completed. 
about what percentage completion? I would say that they are now at the footing stage. Footing, they completed the footing. Mr. Chairman, the customary land secretary that is within the Land Act is to support land management by, by the Land Commission. What do you intend to do if given the opportunity, knowing that you are in charge of Chief Chancy and customary post director are due to improve that secretary? I'm know. talking about the, the, the customary know. land secretary. You know, because we are in charge of chief tenancy, and you know, normally these ones falls under our chiefs. And you know, they have a variety of challenges. And I'm saying that when given the nod, what do you intend to do to improve the services and uh, the challenges that the customary land secretaries is facing to be able to help our chiefs and traditional authorities? The Secretariat is not under the ministry. The Secretariat is under the uh, Ministry of Lands and Natural Resources. I have indicated that there should be closer collaboration between my ministry and that ministry so that where payments are due, the chiefs, these payments are done promptly so that they can use those monies, those royalties or those portions of those monies that ought to come to the chiefs are received as quickly as possible. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, thank you. Yeah, uh, uh, Chairman, I should thank you and to wish our colleague, the Honorable Kum, uh, well, and to urge him that the President is taking him to a very sensitive institution, the Chieftaincy Institution with additional responsibility for religion. There are emotive issues there, so you have to be reflective and sober and work in accordance with Chapter 22 of the Constitution. Chairman relates to me that you've already been referred to Article 270 and 272. You see that customary law and customary usage is part of our practice and within the meaning of Article 11 of the Constitution. On this lesbianism gay, where do you stand as a good Christian? Where do you stand? If it's been yeah, answered, Chairman. Them, uh, 10 questions on them. On them. Oh, now, Chairman, uh, Section 63D, Honor Muntaka helped me with the Chieftaincy Act, so that I quoted for my purposes. Chairman, I'm referencing Nana Ajay Ampofo versus National House of Chiefs and the Attorney General, reported 2011, a Supreme Court decision where Section 63D was held by the court. Supreme Court as unconstitutional. Uh, and then I just read the section 63 for our purposes. A person who acts or performs the functions of, chief, of a chief when that person is not qualified to act. And as I have said, I'm emphasizing 63D. Deliberately refuses to honor a call from a chief to attend to an issue. The Supreme Court is of the view that this is unconstitutional. It reminds me of my first year tutorial in sociology and anthropology at the University of Ghana, I believe by Professor Nukunya and Chris Abochi. And it was a popular question. Quita away the chieftaincy institution. It was a very popular sociological question for first year students. Chiefs used to exercise legislative powers. They used to exercise judicial powers, even religious powers. But modernization has taken it over. Now, the Supreme Court thinks that a chief has no power to invite a person. 
The National House of Chiefs, led by Tokbe Afede, engaged myself and the Honorable Oseiche Mensa Bonso with the Office of the Attorney General. So it requires an amendment. Will you lead the process to make sure that we domesticate by law what has become a decision of the Supreme Court? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I will support whatever collaboration the National House of Chiefs will need to effect the amendment that will give meaning to the true intent of that provision, which has been shut down by the Supreme Court of this country. Thank you. Chairman, just noting further, I have some understanding from the uh, former president of the National House of Chiefs, Tugbe Afeda, that there is some discussion and understanding with the Attorney General Office to improve the text. But ultimately, it will need to come to Parliament for us to legislate on it. Can you give us timelines when this can be done? When I'm giving the note, I would work on it expeditiously. I cannot give timelines because of the processes that involve, most of which I don't have control over. Thank you. Uh, Chairman, so it brings to fore the debate of modernity versus traditionalism. In my part of the country, for instance, and I believe even in the Ashanti Kingdom, uh, who dare you not respond to a call from uh, His Majesty Otunfu uh, Azentehine? Who dare you not to respond to a call from uh, the Paga Pio or the uh, Sandima Paramonsi? But it means that Act 759 of 2008 appreciated that chiefs could do this, and in fact provided that if you refuse to respond to a call to, by a chief, you commit an offense and you are liable to summary conviction to a fine not more than 200 penalty units. How do you marry this delicate balance of chief exercising legitimate authority for the peace and stability of their community and their country against this is my right, is my right, is my human right. What will you do as minister on that? Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I believe that the Supreme Court in its ruling indicated that to attend to an issue was at large. So what kind of interpretation to put on what the issue was, was in controversy. So moving on, once there's the intention to recraft re that particular provision, whatever it takes for us to ensure that it gets the true intent of what the House of Chiefs wants and so that the, they can have the power to adjudicate on those matters that are in contention, we will pursue that part. Thank you very much. German, my is just to end with a comment again. Sensitive area, Dagbam. The president has done his best to resolve aspects of it. It is not complete yet. There are still threats to the institution. There are problems in Nantong, problem in Karaga, Nanung, the uh, paramountcy of the Bimbila, Nanumba traditional area. There are issues. And is the wish of the regent and the other parties in the dispute over there that there is a Supreme Court decision on it similar to Rihanna, which helped guide the Dagbam process. I want to trust that you will guide the president with deep thought in appreciating, in appreciating what the Honorable Ablaqua referred to you, that there are still major, major flat points in the country. In fact, my constituency this morning, Several people have been arrested to the police station from a community known as Young Dakyamile, which started from Monday up to ye yesterday. And Mr. Chairman, to interest you, sons of the same father have disagreed on who should succeed. And that has resulted in the destruction of property. So that's why I'm saying that you have to be level-headed in order to assist the president to deal uh, with, 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 with this delicate uh, institution. Once you are a member of parliament, uh, I wish you well. Thank you, Chairman. 
Very well. Honorable Member Nominee, you appear to have had a substantial engagement with the Center for National Culture. 2000 to 2005, 92 to 96, then 86 to 87. All these periods were, apart from indicating that you did national service with them, you didn't indicate what we were doing there on your CV. 1992 to 96, what were you doing at the National Center for National Culture in Second D? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I was the Assistant Public Relations Officer for the uh, Center for National Culture before, from uh, 92 to 96. And then from 2000 to 2005, I was responsible for administration. Thank you. Well, my next issue is the religious affairs. Do you think that we should draw up some regulation to regulate or provide for some constitutional arrangement, just like you have a model constitution for companies? you think it, it will be practicable to have some model regulation for religious organization so that we can have them operate within certain limits. What's your view? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree with you to the extent that because there are various sects, it has to be done taking cognizance of the various religious beliefs that the individuals profess to. Thank you. Very well. We thank you for attending upon the house to answer questions. You will hear from us later. For now, you are discharged. I'm very grateful, Mr. Chairman.